thank you very much for inviting me to Cardiff, the city that's been particularly kind to me during my career. They might not admit it, but all successful people in business need a bit of luck. I had so much luck, I've never needed a job interview. <laughs> my great-grandfather started a chain of shoe shops in 1865, and the family still had a controlling interest in what was then a public company when I started as a shop assistant in 1960. I was probably promoted too quickly, and by the age of 27, was appointed as a director just in time to be part of a family feud. We sold our part of the family shareholding, and the overall company was acquired by the retail group UDS, United Drapery Stores. So, at the age of 32, I found myself running a business of 350 shoe shops and about 150 shoe repair factories. And I quickly learnt that the way to survive in a group is to ensure that there is another subsidiary that is performing worse than your bit. <laughs> Fortunately, UDS was full of poor performers. <laughs> But I was still there eight years later. But with all these other things going wrong, it wasn't surprising that UDS itself was required, and it was acquired by Hanson Trust, which gave me the chance to do a management buyout, which was a transaction which in itself brought another lucky break. Due to a misunderstanding over intercompany balances, the deal was £4 million better than we expected. <laughs> what a series of luck, and what a dream deal. But the next four years were a nightmare. The mid-1980s was a bad time to have a highly leveraged chain of shoe shops. The market was overcrowded, we made a few mistakes, and we're heading for a loss. I got another bit of luck. We managed to sell the shoe shops. And without any detailed thought, we kept 140 shoe repair outlets, making a profit of less than 400,000 a year. The plan was for it to be a part-time hobby, but I soon realised the potential. Even though the shoe repair market was declining at a rapid rate, we introduced a comprehensive key-cutting service that more than made up the difference. Others, our competitors, didn't see the need to diversify. And, as we introduced engraving and watch repairs, we were able to double the number of our shops by buying some of those competitors. For the next few years, I stalked our only remaining major competitor, which was the UK arm of a global chain called Mr Minute. When their holding company was acquired by UBS, the Swiss bank, I went down to London, confident that they would be keen to sell us their UK, UK shops but I was met with a blunt reply from the merchant banker who said, we, which meant I, am an expert in buying family businesses and putting in professional management, mm -hmm. and you are the next on our list. <laughs> My world changed with that one remark. There could only be one way to compete. We simply had to do a better job and provide a better service. It was then I discovered, after 22 years running the business, the secret behind great customer service. I'm ashamed it took so long, because it is so simple and so obvious. You can't create exceptional service through a set of rules. The only way is to trust the colleagues in our shops with the freedom to serve each customer the best way they can. With the shop colleagues in control and every tier of management there, not to give orders, but to help and support. At first, the shop colleagues simply didn't trust me. They felt uncomfortable having no rules. So I made a couple up for them. <laughs> Rule one, look the part, which meant wear the uniform, turn up on time, keep a smart shop, and rule two, rule two, put the money in the till. <laughs> but 
But the biggest lesson we learnt was about our people. Our upside-down way of working only succeeds with the right characters. Our recruitment was all wrong. We were looking for cobblers and key cutters when we should have been picking people with personality. We can teach a guy with character how to repair shoes, but you can't put personality into a grumpy cobbler. <laughs> My maverick method of upside-down management seems to have worked. That guy at Mr. Minute, who was good at putting professional managers into a family business, lost £120 million in four years, and we were able to buy the shops we wanted for a pound. <laughs> so you can see I have had more than my share of luck. But I had something else, a guardian angel called Alex. Alex gave us all a bit of a social conscience, and she taught me how to make decisions based on common sense. Non-executives, consultants, and even at times bank managers have had their part to play. But my most sound advice always came from Alex. So what lessons have I learned over the last 55 years? In a world full of best practice, guidelines and governance, city shareholders would have disapproved of my maverick approach to management, and I would never have discovered that true delegation is the best way to give great service and make more money. Despite all my luck, I still worry about next year and even next week. But life is meant to be full of uncertainty. If you always know what is going to happen next, there would be no thrill in achievement, no big surprises, perhaps no disappointments, but still stress, the stress that comes with boredom. From all the evidence I have seen, you can still be nice and at the same time run a good business. <laughs>